to allow to allow Melissa's um, note taker to record this. I think this is an auto message and probably not real, but Melissa, if you actually want this to be allowed, please let me know in the next oh, 10 seconds. Otherwise I'm just gonna deny it. Okay, I'm gonna deny that. Um, okay, welcome everybody. I'm really glad to see you tonight. Um, we are, um, so I am recording this as you probably got the message about that. Um, and I'm gonna post it on our YouTube channel in the next day or so. Um, welcome to our October presentation. We're welcoming Heidi Dollard, who will talk to us about an ecological fall cleanup. Um, first, a few reminders, and I will put links to these things I'm telling you about in the chat once Heidi starts. Um, but I don't want to take up any extra time because she has a lot of wonderful things to, to talk to us about. Um, the first reminder is our next brown bag lunch is Wednesday, November 5th, noon to one. Um, they're the first Wednesdays of the month, and they are drop-in. Um, you can come with questions or come to listen or come to share projects. There's no... There's no agenda. You just show up. We don't record them. They're really just ways to check in with other pollinator advocates and um, get support and give support. Um, our November monthly presentation is going to be Tuesday, November 12th. It's it's going to be a good one with Emily May of Xerxes, and um, they'll be talking about night pollinators, which is something that I think we often, we tend to forget once it gets dark out, that there are lots of creatures out there um, doing good work in the night. And then please note it is earlier in the month than usual um, due to Thanksgiving. And then because of Christmas holidays, winter holidays, we are not having a December presentation at all. So our next, our last one of the year will be Tuesday, November 12th. Um, now on to our main event. Heidi Dollard is the steering committee co-chair of the Massachusetts Pollinator Network. That's us. She works to educate gardeners and homeowners on how they can support pollinators and other beneficial wildlife while creating a beautiful and low maintenance landscape. She has an MS in biology and is a master gardener. She's been an enthusiastic native plant gardener for many years, and she is just a terrific part of the pollinator network. That's not in her bio, I'm adding that in, but it is true. Um, please hold questions until the end. Um, you can put them in the chat and I can keep track of them, but Heidi would prefer not to be, like she wants to do the presentation and then she's gonna take time for questions. So I will now um, pass this on to Heidi. Thanks, Heidi. Hi, everybody. I am thrilled to see you all here because this topic, which does not get, I'm sharing my screen, hold on, um, is just as important as everything we talk about the rest of the year, you know, what plans to plant, getting a succession of bloom, all those good things. But what we do now is really just as vital as what we do the rest of the year. And to that end, my slides are not advancing. Oh, here we go. This is the real title of the, of the talk, the ecological and envi environmental importance of all the dead stuff in your yard and why you should keep it there. So just to remind you, you Everybody is here because they know that we're in the midst of a very, very worrisome biodiversity crisis. We're losing species, we're individual numbers of, of members of species are rapidly declining, birds are disappearing, um, the disappearance of insects has been well documented, and we can and should be actively doing something about this. Um, one fact that is really brings home the importance of what we're doing is something that Doug Talame emphasizes that caterpillars are baby food, baby food for birds. Most, the vast majority of birds have to feed their birds insects. Most of them feed them caterpillars. It takes a huge number of caterpillars to raise a clutch of, of chicks. Um, thousands and thousands and thousands of them. So we need to be literally gardening for insects because that's, they're the basis of the food chain. And this these facts are well documented, but I just kind of want to remind everybody that not only do we need those 70% native plants in our landscape, we need to provide somewhere 
for all of those individuals to overwinter so they can survive and reproduce and provide food for next year's baby birds. So this is just a reminder of the nutrient cycle because what we're talking about is really, is really about maintaining the nutrient cycle and not interrupting them. So as you can see in this diagram, leaves fall off trees, they go to the ground, they decompose. As they decompose, they feed the soil. All of that decomposition is home for endless numbers of critters, including um, all the, the early late early life stages of many, many critical insects. Some of them in overwinter as adults, some of them as eggs, some of them as some sort of um, cocoon, but most of them are either in the dead leaves or they're burrowing into the soil underneath the dead leaves. So not only do we need there is habitat, but all of that biomass is incredible amount of nutrients that we want to keep in our soil. We want to keep it in our yards and feed our soil. Um, if you don't, if you perform a traditional fall cleanup, you're sending that massive amount of habitat and nutrients to the landfill. So that's bad enough, but once it gets to the landfill, it decomposes but in it, you, it, because the piles are so big and they don't get any oxygen in them, the type of, of decomposition actually is anaerobic, no oxygen. It produces methane, which is a terrible greenhouse gas. It contributes to global warming. Um, over a short period, it does eventually dissipate. It dissipates, you know, very relatively quickly, but before it does, it's 80 times more potent at warming the earth than carbon dioxide. In addition, all of that traditional cleanup, the transporting, shipping, chopping, all of that generates much more carbon dioxide. Most of that equipment does not have any pollution controls on it. So it's really a double whammy. But all of those dead plants, as I said, they are ecological gold. They provide food and habit for countless organisms. So we can, I'm mostly going to be talking about fallen leaves, standing and falling dead wood, flower stalks and seed heads, but also tall clumps of dead grass are really valuable. All of that dead material is something that you should treasure and not send away <laughs> to the dump. So first let's talk about leaves as natural mulch. First and foremost, if you, leave, if you just use leaves as mulch, it's less work for you and you save money. So many people I see this time of year, they're diligently blowing and raking the leaves out of their garden beds. And then they're going and they're buying bags and bags of bark mulch, which is just nuts. It's crazy, it's a waste of money and it's a waste of really, really valuable plant material that also is habitat. So as I said, as the leaves break down, they build the soil, they release nutrients, they feed the trees, they feed other plants. It's also really important for groundwater retention, which as you may be aware, as our storms get more and more severe, it's more and more important that as the rain falls, it's infiltrated quickly. It, if it hits a hard surface, whether it's asphalt or compacted lawn, it's going to run off. And that runoff is a huge problem. So if you can provide a softer, more absorbent surface, you're also reducing possibly flooding and certainly um, spreading pollutants into groundwater. So it's really important to make sure nearly all ground is covered, especially over the winter for all of these reasons. So you've heard the expression, leave the leaves. And a really great way to do that is to build a garden bed 
around your trees. So as the leaves fall, they just stay where they landed and they provide mulch, they build the soil. It's a great environment for planting and um, it will also suppress, it'll pr suppress weeds. Um, so as I said, many, many of those critters are overwintering in the leaves, in the rotted leaves, it, some of them are just clinging to the leaves. So the, some of them, after they fall to earth, then burrow into the soil. So if you're shipping all those leaves off to the dump, you're greatly reducing the populations of insects in your yard that you are very busy feeding with flowering plants, with native plants the rest of the year. So this is part of the full cycle of really supporting biodiversity. So in this picture, it shows, unfortunately, this is not a native plant, a uh, native tree, it's, it's a non-native um, magnolia, but it shows how there's a very um, plantable bed underneath what I, what I call the drip line. So the drip line is the edge of the farthest twig, you draw a straight line down, and most of the leaves will fall within the drip line. And if you can, create garden beds in that space, that is a win-win-win for everybody. Your trees will thank you. In the left-hand picture, you see typical lawn. This is in public space. Um, the ground is very compacted, doesn't absorb water. Um, one reason why the ground is so compacted is that repeated mowing with heavy equipment that heavy equipment compacts the soil. It, it forces it down and it becomes hard and like hard like asphalt eventually. It doesn't support many microorganisms or larger organisms and it's very expensive to maintain. On the right hand side, we have a more ecological, also a public space where there's um, understory plantings of native plants. It provides what we call a soft landing for insects. Um, the soil is rich, it absorbs water, and it's much, much lower maintenance. So I wanna talk a bit about mulching. Mulching is really a valuable thing. It really preserves soil health, as I said, but you do not want to pile mulch up around trees, any kind of, really any plant, but especially around um, woody plants that have bark because it promotes rot. It, it and it pre prevents a really deep mulch will prevent oxygen from getting to roots in the soil. And I see this all the time, everywhere I go. This is what a lot of commercial landscapers do. I don't know why they think it's a good idea. It's a terrible idea. If you have this in your yard, run out tomorrow morning and immediately move all that mulch away from your tree chunks. Um, it's also better not to chop or blow or mow the leaves, as I've said. All of those things chop up the organisms. Now, a lot of organic um, gardening instructions will recommend chopping up leaves and then putting them in your garden. And I have to admit, I, before I knew that there was all these good critters in the leaves, I love chopped up leaves. And I, I actually hired people to come and chop up my leaves. And then I used them on my garden beds. I, I, I don't do that anymore. I try to preserve as many of my leaves whole and let them leave, stay where they fell. If you have lawn, and a lot of people need lawn, then you can chop up the leaves on your lawn and use them in your garden bed. They do make a wonderful mulch. They're really great in vegetable gardens and traditional flower gardens. Um, but in any case, don't pile leaves too high. They, um, especially around trees, if they really get too high, they will harbor ticks and they aren't, they, um, they will take longer to break down. Now, oak leaves are kind of a special case because they're so tough. So um, I do like oak leaves. I like them because they take a long time to break down, but 
um, if you pile, if there's a lot of oak leaves in your flower garden in the spring, you may need to gently move the leaves off so that some of the plants can push through. Some plants will push through fine. Some of them may need a little help. Something else I recommend with oak leaves, if you have a lot of oak leaves that have fallen into the branches of some bushes, you should remove them um, before growth starts in the spring because they can shade out the lower branches, like if you have azaleas or plants like that, and then the, the, lower, the lower branches will die. So oak leaves need a little bit of extra attention, but they still make a great mulch. So contrary to conventional gardening, I hear, I, I get all these questions. Um, people are really concerned when they look into a pile of leaves and they see these, these white threads. They are correct in that that is fungus. And they are correct in that some fungus, fu some fungi really are disease, um, you know, cause terrible diseases. But there's 6 million different species of fungus in the world. And many, many, many of them provide a really vital ecological service in that they help break things down. They help things rot. And this is important because it releases the nutrients into the soil and makes it available for other organisms. So when you see these, these white threads, they're called mycelium. Don't worry, they're not going to infect your plants. A lot of people are worried about that. Don't worry about these. These are specialized fungi, fungi and th their job is to just break things down. It's not a disease organization organism. And leaves and pine needles do not make the soil more acidic. Our soil, our natural soils in New England are already, most of them, not all of them, are naturally on the acidic side. And that's, that's the nature of our soil, which coincidentally is what a lot of our native plants want. So um, you, don't, you don't need to worry about that. You do need to worry about the pH in your vegetable garden. And so I do recommend taking regular soil tests in your vegetable garden because getting the right pH can make a really huge difference in the productivity and health of your plants. But in a natural environment, most trees and bushes, I mean, in, with native trees and bushes and um, grasses and herbaceous plants, that it, this will not make the soil too acidic for them. Um, shallow leaf mulch does not increase tick populations. And I'll talk a little bit more about tick populations. If you really pile up the leaves it very deep, like up to your knees, which I do see a lot of people doing who live on the edge of the woods just year after year. Actually, I was one of these people. I just, you know, piled the leaves in the woods and we had this giant berm of leaves that will increase tick populations. So that's another reason to just leave the leaves where they fall. They make a shallow mulch that unless you have oak leaves, they will be broken down by the following spring. It'll be a very, very shallow mulch. And leaf and mulch and brush piles don't attract pest insects to your vegetable garden. I, I read this all the time. Oh, you know, keep brush, keep this away from your vegetable garden. Actually, if you have a very healthy insect population with the, a mix of predators and prey species, they're more likely to keep your pest insects in check if you provide habitat for those predators. So again, don't worry about that. And I also, people just freak out when they see mushrooms, or some people, maybe not you guys, but mushrooms are not a problem. It's just more evidence of fungi breaking down leaves and other dead material. They're not, they're only a problem if you eat them, so don't eat them. On to trees. All trees, living, standing, dead, and fallen, are incredibly important ecologically. And I am very concerned. So many people are very, very eager to cut down trees. They're worried that they'll fall on them, fall on their house, fall on their car. They're leaning. 
And uh, unfortunately, a lot of arborists, professional arborists really encourage this kind of fear of trees. A, a tree that is diseased, lightly diseased, can stand for decades. And if it's really, really sick, the best thing to do from an ecological point of view is to take down the branches, but not the whole tree, leave as much of the tree standing as possible. So a standing trunk without the, the branches on it probably will never fall. It will just kind of gently rot. It will just kind of melt <laughs> slowly. <laughs> and as it does, it's providing incredibly valuable habitat to possibly billions of creatures, billions of insects and microorganisms, which are a really essential part of the food chain. You don't see a pileated woodpecker except in woods where there's dead trees because that's what they need. They need dead trees for the insects and for the holes that they then live in. So um, please, refrain from cutting trees as much as possible, even if they seem to have a wound or a hole or even some kind of visible disease, just let them go gently and slowly into the night. And please, if at all possible, don't cut down a healthy living tree. So, I just want to point out that standing deadwood is now a very, very um, fashionable sculptural statement in very um, famous and upscale gardens. On the left is a picture that I took at, on a um, garden tour in Newburyport. As you know, Newburyport is a very upscale neighborhood. And all of the gardens that we saw were obviously, including this one, owned by very wealthy people. And the owners of this property chose to keep this, this um, dead tree very visible from their very manicured pool garden because it really was very dramatic and interesting sculpture. And on the right-hand side is a picture of some dead tree trunks in a garden uh, I visited in a garden tour in England. And I was chatting with the uh, the head gardener and they, in England, they're having a lot of trouble with climate change because the climate is changing so rapidly. It's becoming much hotter and drier and they're losing a lot of plants. And they had, they had a massive die off of these trees in their garden. And their decision was to just leave, leave the, the trunk standing because they thought it really was very dramatic and interesting. And it, and it was a net um, benefit just to the beauty of their garden. I just want to point out in American art, there's a very strong tradition of including dead and dying trees. They have tremendous artistic uh, significance and symbolism. So, you know, you would be right up there with famous artists and garden designers. So if you have all this dead wood and you don't want to ship it off, you don't want it chipped, you don't want it ship, you want it, keep it on your property and maintain it as habitat. What can you do with it? This is actually one of my favorite parts of the talk. So I'll try not to spend too much time on it. Um, the picture on the left, I took it the Tower Hill Botanic Garden. This is in a wooded area, and they just took all the fallen branches and they made this cool spiral. It's it's a um, not a maze. It's um, something you walk for meditation, but it's totally cool. Took absolutely zero artistic talent. They just chucked all these things in a spiral. Anybody could do it. And yet it's very visually arresting. And then on the right-hand side, we have um, some log piles that were created by, um, you know, 
a garden designer to be very beautiful and artistic. And they're, but they're log piles, you know, and they are very dramatic and interesting visually. Okay, on to stuff that might be a little part, some of it. Um, and the upper left is a, a brush pile that was designed to be neater and um, I think they call it a habitat pile. This is in the Chanticleer Garden in um, Pennsylvania, if you're familiar with it. It's one of the most famous artistic gardens. It's one of my favorite gardens. And they're always doing crazy creative stuff with materials that they just found around the garden. In the upper left is a tree stump. And again, if you do take down a tree, don't, don't have the stump chipped because it's harboring all those great critters. And this is a case where they turned it into a decorative element and then they let the kids decorate the, the yard around the little house. They just put a roof on the stump and the lower, um, the lower left is just a very simple, simple bench. It's not been treated with any kind of preservative. So of course, all these things are eventually gonna rot, but that's good, that's what we want. Rot is good. And then in, in the lower right is one of my favorites. You could just send your kids out if you have enough space in the backyard and let them build forts and fairy houses. My son went to a camp where that was the main activity, just going into the woods and building Quartz with downed wood, and it was one of his favorite camps ever. It was, it's free material. Your kids are not on their phone. They're not on the computer. They're just out there building stuff. So other ideas include um, garden edging, um, hugel culture. That is when you make a mound with some dead wood. It can be brush, it can be logs. You cover it with, this is a simplified um, explanation. You cover it with soil and then you turn it into a garden. And in fact, I, I built some fairly high raised beds and because I didn't have enough soil to fill them and also because I had a lot of downed wood on my property, I filled the bottom of the raised beds first with all this downed wood and then I topped it with soil. And those raised beds are, they're pretty great that all that wood underneath there retains a lot of moisture and um, the plants are very happy. You can make the walls out of raised beds. I've seen um, compost piles made out of just upended log segments put in a circle, wattle fences, sculpture, planters, trellises, all kinds of stuff. Here's some more pictures. Of course, my favorite is the horse sculpture, which might be beyond our artistic abilities. Um, the, the upper middle is more sculpture from Tower Hill. The, <laughs> that kind of three-toed sculpture is actually part of a tree chunk that was upended, turned upside down. And the owls, okay, we can't probably build those owls, but using those those cut off dead tree stumps as a plinth for sculpture is a really cool idea. And then of course, you know, stakes, the middle picture, the middle lower picture is using just cut off sections of some thin saplings. They were sharpened on one end to make a, a nice garden edging. And then there's just simply laying, you know, laying stuff on the ground to use as an edging. And it will rot, but that's good. We want it to rot. Flower heads and stalks are really, really important to leave. The birds love them. I love seeing the birds flitting amongst the dead flower stalks, picking off the seeds. Um, one reason why the stalks are really important that many native bees reproduce in an overwinter in stalks. They, they um, make a sort of, they lay their, well, I have a, I have a slide, I will show you. The stalks with more than a quarter inch hollow or pithy centers are most valuable. And the dead flower heads 
are another really great source of winter interest. So here's um, a diagram of showing, this is from Heather, I think it's from Heather Holm, um, how to create habitat for stem nesting bees. So I will, I, I won't go into detail about this, but ideally you leave a good deal of the, of the stalk standing. The bees lay their eggs and provision them with balls of pollen. In summer, you can't see it because the, the flower, the new growth is hiding it. Then in the winter, they're in there, overwintering, hibernating, and in the spring, you can, again, you start the, the um, cycle all over again. And the bees that were in last year's dead stalks are now mature and are flying away. So again, dead flower heads have tremendous visual in, in interest. On the left-hand side is a picture from a Pete Rudolph garden. Um, if you're not familiar with Pete Rudolph, he's probably the most famous and celebrated garden designer in the world today. And one of his principles for when he chooses which plants to use in his compositions, what he decides whether or not they're garden worthy is what they look like when they're dead, because he thinks that that's a very important visual element. And you can see this in this professional photograph, which I took from his website. And, but on the right is, is just from my backyard. And it shows how wonderful those black, black seed heads can look in the fall and winter landscape. More pictures, again, Pete Uldoff um, on the left, Heidi on the right. So what, okay, now you're not raking, you're not cutting. What are you gonna do with all your time? You, is there nothing to do? No, there is still a lot to do. So it is really important to weed, weed, weed. Um, any perennial weeds that you've left in your garden that you don't want are gonna be just going gangbusters by spring. There's a lot of weeds that actually germinate in the fall and then they take off in the spring. So don't put off weeding. And then more important perhaps than anything else is removing invasive plants from your property. And now is an especially good time for removing invasives because, well, for two reasons. One, many, many invasive plants retain their foliage longer than native plants. So they're very visible in the landscape. And I have three examples of that. In um, the top left picture is bittersweet. And you can see the vegetation around it is pretty much died off, but those bittersweet leaves are still bright green. Some of them are yellow now, but it's much easier to spot them. Um, over on the upper right, the multiflora rose, it both retains its green leaves, but even when it loses its leaves, you can see the green stalks really, really clearly. So they're much easier to find. And then the bottom is um, buckthorn. It turns, it's, it's also usually retains its, um, oh, wait a minute, that's not buckthorn. <laughs> that is uh, the, winged euonymus, which is another terrible, terrible invasive. And it turns that kind of pink color in the shade. It's bright, bright. Um, so this is burning bush. It turns bright, bright red in the sun, but in a shady wooded situation, it's kind of like a washed out pink. Very, very easy to spot. Perfect time to pull it out and eradicate it. If you are one of the people who uses um, the cut and dab method of using herbicides, which is something we could talk about at the brown bag lunch if you want. It's very controversial, um, but it's something I do because I have so many invasives in my yard. In fact, these three pictures were taken from my backyard just the other day. Um, the, if the, those 
little bit, little tiny dabs of herbicide that you use on the cut stem is especially effective because at this time of year, the plant is drawing its resources down into the root and it will take that herbicide with it and it's more likely to effectively kill the root. As I mentioned, now is the time to do soil tests and adjust the pH if needed. I also mentioned that um, most of our native soils are well suited to our native plants. So there's very few instances where I think you would need to change the pH if you have a native plant landscape, but you may need to adjust the pH if you have a vegetable garden and you may need to, if you are maintaining a lawn, um, lawn grasses like it a little bit more alkaline. They like it, um, so you may need to apply lime to help your grass. On the other hand, if you wanna kill your grass or you wanna weaken your grass because you're planting, interplanting with some native plants, you could actually add sulfur. And I just read about this in the New York Times, and I don't really know how much sulfur or how acidic you might want to make it. So it's something to investigate. It's not something I can really advise you on, but it's a very interesting concept. So as I mentioned, making sure all your bare ground is covered with mulch but do leave a little bit of bare ground in an inconspicuous place for ground nesting bees. They, they do need some uncovered ground. Now is a really good time to start new garden beds under those leaves with cardboard. If you lay down the cardboard, pin it down securely, and then a whole bunch of leaves fall on top of it, you have instant garden bed, not instant, but easy garden bed that will be ready to plant in the spring. Um, something else I hear a lot from people is they're really worried about diseased plant material and they want to send it to the dump. And I think the concern about diseased plant material is a little overblown too. You can keep it on your property. You may not want to put it back into your compost bin, which then you're going to put back into your vegetable garden, but maybe you could find like a little out of the way place to just lay it on the ground and it'll just melt into nothing. Many of many diseases aren't going to survive the winter or they're already in the soil and there's really, you know, what you do with the leaves isn't really going to make any difference. Um, and lastly, um, collecting seeds for winter sowing is a delightful fall activity. And um, I, if you don't know about winter sowing, I um, recommend that you do a little internet research because it's a way to really make a lot more plants. So it's too late now to do some of these tasks, um, but I just do want to mention that it's a, these are good fall activities. Of course, removing invasives should happen all the time. It's just so important that Landscapes, which are predominantly native plants, are just really lacking in biodiversity. So if you can maintain your landscape, largely control your invasives, that's a huge thing to promote bio biodiversity in, in your yard and in the land around you, because any invasives that produce seeds will inevitably spread around your neighborhood. Um, so if looking ahead to next September, again, it's too late for some of these things, planting a cover crop in the vegetable garden. The picture on the right is buckwheat. It's one of my favorite cover crops because it really, really loosens the soil and then it winter kills, it dies, it just adds to the soil. Um, as I mentioned, start new garden beds. If you want to be working on converting your lawn to a more ecological lawn. September is a really good time to overseed with clover and are an eco lawn mix, but you have to de-thatch really, really, really thoroughly so that those seeds make good soil contact. Good time, September is a good time to plant. Adding native plants 
for your landscape. And there are some, there are some plants that will have ripe seeds for collecting and winter sowing. Now, what about ticks? Um, this uh, People talk to me about ticks all the time, and it's not something I want to minimize. Ticks are dangerous. They carry diseases. I don't, I don't want to tell you not to worry, but having a smart approach to ticks will protect you and the landscape. So understand that ticks are usually found on taller vegetation in moist areas. So a lot of times this is on woodland edges. It can be in a moist meadow. They like to be on vegetation that's kind of like knee height or a little higher so they can easily jump onto you. But if you have a very biodiverse landscape where you have a lot of um, a good mix of wildlife, you'll have a lot of tick predators and that could reduce the tick population. Here's another case though, where invasives are a problem. The Japanese barber barberry in particular has been demonstrated, so this is well documented, that it actually increases the local tick population and increases the incidence of Lyme disease. They think the reason is that the Japanese barberry harbors a lot of white-footed mice, which are a vector for um, the deer ticks. But now they're finding other invasive plants also seem to increase the tick population. I'm not sure that there's a reasonable explanation for it, but that correlation is another good reason to really be battling the invasives in your, in your yard. Um, ticks do not grow on taller grass. That There's um, a researcher who's recently was at UMass. She still works locally for the USDA. She found no ticks on taller grass. So that should not be a concern if you, if you want to mow higher. But the best thing to do is to protect yourself, your own body, when you go out into an area where there may be a lot of ticks, is to um, tuck your pants into your socks, spray your socks, or buy clothing or create clothing that is has been permeated with permethrin, which is will kill and repel ticks, but also be be very careful around cats because it's very toxic to cats. But if you take those kinds of personal precautions, bo both for you and your family, you really will not get ticks. So keeping the neighbors happy is really an important aspect of native plant gardening and having a wilder, more biodiverse landscape. And one of the most important things that you can do is to keep clean edges. So even if you have a meadow in your lawn, if you mow the edge, it will be visually much more acceptable to people who may not be on board with your biodiversity agenda. Don't, have, don't allow plants to flop into the sidewalk or the road where people might have to brush against them. They do, many, many people do not want to touch plants involuntarily. They, they find it very um, intimidating and they will feel invaded if those plants are falling into the public domain. So respect that. And also, you know, those tall floppy plants could genuinely have ticks. Plus, you know, in wet weather, it could be wet. People could get there, you know, have to walk through wet vegetation. So showing that you respect the people who are interacting with your landscape, I think is, is very important to be um, a good ambassador for native plant um, landscapes. Um, as I said, it's really important to retain the wood and brush piles. So if you can't do something kind of showy and artistic with them, just put them out of sight. You know, hopefully you have some hidden corner behind the shed, behind the garage. Nobody's going to see it. Um, something else that's a good practice is if you feel that your 
flower stalks are really, really unwieldy and unattractive. Cut them down toward the front of the border. Try to leave them as tall as you as you can. But this is, I've read that this is called giving the garden a mullet, you know, similar to a haircut. So cut it down in the front, but leave it wild in, and long in the back. And signs can really help um, to demonstrate to people what you're doing and maybe engender a conversation. It's also been shown that the best way to convert people or to educate people around you is actually to be a model, to be an example and explain to people what you're doing. So um, putting up a sign will often just diffuse any ob objections people might have to a very tall lawn or a very wild looking landscape. So this is one of my favorite quotes from Doug Tallamy. These are exciting times. The necessary task of restoring ecological function to the land lies before us, but is, it is an exhilarating, entertaining, and hugely rewarding task. So I also wanna mention that the people that I speak to who are on this journey, who have made changes to their property have been just astonished and delighted at the transformation that they've seen. They didn't realize how sterile and lifeless their landscape was when it was primarily lawn. But once they have dead wood, they have native plants, they have um, a, an abundance of different flowers, they see all of the life that they were missing. And it's very, very exciting and exhilarating. And they, you know, they're, they're so happy that they started it. I've never talked to anybody who has regrets. So thank you. I kind of whizzed through that because I wanted to leave some time for questions. So um, maybe Renee could read me if there's questions or people could raise their hand. Maybe Renee could recognize them if there's any questions. Yeah, let's do it. Thank you, Heidi, so much. That was so informative. Um, yes, I would say if you are comfortable raising your hand and asking your question yourself, that's great. If you'd rather have me read it, you could put it in the chat um, and we can get started. Heidi, do you want to stop sharing? I guess maybe leave your info up for I'm just I'm trying to stop sharing. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Are there questions? Oh, there are seven questions in the chat. Um, yes. Yeah, so it, let's see. Susan um, read that some cardboard can have PFAS in it. Oh, that's not something we want to do. What can have PFAS in it? Cardboard. Um, uh, that is really. You know, I had news. read that most cardboard was pretty safe. Even the ink is safe because it's mostly made from, it's, it's you know, regulations require that it's made from soybeans. So this is this is the first that I've heard that cardboard has PFAS in it. That's, Susan, if I, you, I'll, have to, I'll have to look into that because I really feel that, you know, using cardboard as mulch in the garden is, it, it's very effective and it's a great way to, you know, reuse, recycle cardboard. So I'll I'll have to look into that. But you and could Susan, you could you create a new garden bed just, you know, if you get enough leaves on top of grass, they'll kill the grass. As you know, if yeah. you have maintained a lawn much of your life, as much of most of us have. Um, Susan, if you get more info on that, feel free to share it either just to me at my email, which I'll put in the chat or um, to the pollinator network at large would be great. Um, Carol, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Heidi. That was really, really great. Uh, I learned a lot. And also just reinforce things that I've read. So it really, it's very helpful. Um, so I have a question about... Um, Bees laying eggs 
is it are they laying their eggs in last year what you left from last year so that's really important I just that right. just occurred to me like a few months ago that it's because you're I was saying well if I'm leaving everything and I'm not cutting it how are they getting into the stems and then so it's last year so you should yeah really, so actually really have to be careful to leave, is, leave it right. all summer and not cut it right you would spring, need to what leave. you left from this year I need to leave it all you so need to leave it okay. all year I mean okay. eventually at least in my garden it just crumbles into right. nothing right you know and um and it's really not visible once the new mm -hmm. you know the new growth starts in the spring mm -hmm. I almost never cut any stalks anymore yeah I like the way I like the way it looks there's there's one thing that I do sometimes cut. I'm a big um I'm a big fan of pokeweed. Does everyone know what pokeweed is? It's that crazy native plant with mm -hmm. it has like the bright pink stems and those really dark blue um kind of kind of looks like miniature grape bunches the berries look like. Well, a lot of people hate pokeweed because it's so aggressive and it's messy, but it's a fabulous, fabulous wildlife plant. And and they do, once they, like halfway through the winter, they really look like a pile of mess. So I just cut them and stack them neatly in an out of the way place. And uh, Heather Holm even says that's fine if you really do need to cut stalks, as long as you're not chopping them or, you know, sending them to the dump. If you just leave them even upright in an inconspicuous corner, then whatever was overwintering in there will be able to complete its light cycle and move on. So can I ask one more quick question? Yeah. yeah. Um, is there a safe time to shred leaves? Like after the winter and at what point in the spring do you think? Hmm, that's an um, interesting question. Well, they used to say that you could, well, the advice on mowing was used to be to preserve insect populations, to try to mow in the spring after there had been several days, you know, like a week of weather above 50 degrees. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the advice is getting a little bit more nuanced than that. Mm -hmm. That I th So I think it probably, there's always going to be critters in leaves. It's, you know, but is it, will there be less critters? I don't, you know, maybe I'm not really sure, but based on what they used to say about mowing, yeah, probably after... But also, I want to reassure people, you do not need to save every leaf intact in your yard. You, you will have to mow some leaves if you, if you have grass, um, but that's okay. The main thing is that you're providing some habitat. Ideally, the best real estate is that under your trees. So if you're mowing, you know, an area for your kids to play or you want to play badminton or you've got dogs you know don't don't sweat about it it's 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 not necessary to be absolutely dogmatic about every leaf so thanks yeah. um tracy asks is it okay to cut down stalks in the spring well they say to leave leave some dead stalks indefinitely. I mean, through an entire cycle, because the, some of those critters will actually use the dead stalks and then they'll need another year to complete their life cycle. But there again, you don't need to leave every stalk. If you're leaving some stalks or a lot of stalks, that's great. But if there's some stalks that just drive you crazy, they're right next to your front door and you think it looks really crappy. Well, you can cut those stalks and then ones farther away that are less noticeable, leave those, leave those. Does, um, that, does that make sense? 
Yes. Yeah. Tracy, if you have further comment, go ahead and you can add it. Um, another question. What are some native ground covers that grow in full shade under oak trees? Oh, I forgot one parameter on that. Uh, <laughs> deer, res deer resistant. <laughs> A big one. Well, off the top of my head, um, I would give Canada anemone a try. Okay. Do you know that plant? I don't, but I will research it. It's okay. It comes with a warning label. It's okay. incredibly aggressive. It's really, really, really takes off. If it's happy, it will, it will take, it will cover the ground. You can, other things can grow through it. Um, it kind of escaped in one of my garden beds and I just thought, you know what? It's not worth fighting. And I've been surprised at the number of things it can coexist with. And it makes a really nice um, ground cover underneath taller woody plants. So it gets maybe at most, I don't know, maybe eight, eight inches, maybe 10 at the most. And it has a really pretty single white flower in um, late spring. And it's, I think I think it could it could do okay under under oaks, but a lot of stuff can grow under oak trees because oak trees have deeper roots. So um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff you could try. Um, you could try uh, tier, the tier, tierarella. Um, yes, I'm familiar with that one. Yep. Uh, what else? Um, Sarah suggested moss. Anybody have other suggestions? Sarah in the chat suggested moss and asters. Yeah, asters. Tons and tons and tons of woodland asters would be thrilled to live underneath an oak tree. But would deer eat those? Um, Probably. Some, some not. Yeah. Um, rabbits. Rabbits like a lot of asters. Okay. Yeah, but... Boy, if anything's eating my anemone, they they have made no serious inroads into it. Something else that might be nice is green and gold chrysogonum. Are you familiar with that? No. That's that. It's very very. It's much lower and spreads slowly. But boy, it's beautiful. I really I love that plant. Amy, did you have some suggestions? I put a few in the chat. There's oh, a good. native ginger. There's Carex pensylvanica, which almost looks like a normal grass, but is softer. That's true. Um, there's a late blooming aster, which is it's called aromatic aster, so it's a little bit. Scented. Oh, I just I just got one of those actually. That's funny. I just need I about eight thousand more. <laughs> the latest blooming ones, and because it has a scent, it's a little bit more deer resistant. It um, said it needed par partial sun, though, but we'll see. Uh, I have a half acre that the deer have denuded, and I I have a choice. I can try just putting ferns back there, or I can fence it. I was, you know, I don't, I'm at a loss with it, because our concentration is getting worse and worse. You know, uh, um, calico aster is something I see a lot, and white wood aster, there's about, maybe five, seven different aster species that just love to be in the woods and they are late blooming. But if you get enough of them, they really make a, a very um, beautiful show in the fall. Okay. I'll give them a try. So the last question I see, um, and if I have missed one, please um, pipe up, is I have, this is from Ralph. I have a fairly large field, approximately four acres, that I've been mowing half of on alternate years. What do you think of that approach? Um, I think the latest advice that I have read on mowing is to actually mow every three years, but mowing every two years might be fine. A lot might depend on how much woody growth you have in the meadow. If you have a lot of 
see, you know, woody seedlings coming up, coming up and heaven forbid, bittersweet. And it might be the best thing. I, you know, I'm, the more I read, the more I realize that mowing is getting the best mowing regime for a particular situation is it's a little tricky. There's no like one size fits all. And a lot of plants that we really, really want to encourage like to be mowed. They, they, they thrive in a regularly mowed situation. So, um, but if, if you really want to preserve the insects, I think every three years, if you could divide, divide your property into three and rotate the, the piece that gets mowed, that might be ideal. Because then that leaves two years for, eat, for eat any one patch to really support those insects and allow them to complete their life cycles and move on. Thank you very much. It's, I'll try it. Thank you, Heidi. Um, I really appreciate you doing this amazing talk. Um, it's been so helpful. I learned a ton. Um, even though I get to talk to you every day, I feel like I, I don't actually get to hear your wisdom on this. So it was really, it was really great. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I hope to see you at our next brown bag lunch on, um, let's see, on November 5th. I put that in the chat. And then our again, our next presentation is November 12th, which is a couple weeks earlier than usual. So do mark your calendars for that. Um, and the registration links for both of those events are also in the chat. And then I will be sending this recording out to anyone who registered for the for to attend the meeting. Um, and that will also be on our YouTube channel, as are all of our previous ones. Our brown bag <laughs> is on November 6th and November 5th is election day. You're totally right. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is Wednesday, November 6th. Thank you, Vivian. <laughs> um, so ignore what I wrote and listen to Vivian instead. <laughs> and I will send out reminders for those as well before. But um, thank you all. And it was lovely to see everybody and have a great night. Great. Thank Great you problem. all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.